Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to tonight's webinar entitled Spring Into Sports, What You Need to Know About Exercise and Your Heart. I'm Mona, and I'll be your host today, along with Rana, whom you can't see, but she will be monitoring the uh, Q&A section, the chat, and assisting with the interactive portion of today's program and responding to any non-medical questions that might be posted. Uh, before we get started with Dr. Flanagan, I'd like to go over just a couple of housekeeping details so that everyone knows how they can participate in today's event. Um, first off, all attendees are muted and your video videos are off. You will have the opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Flanagan, um, and you can do that one of two ways. The first is that you can simply type your question into the Q&A box, which can be done at any time during the presentation. And uh, once the prepared remarks are finished, I will be reading those to Dr. Flanagan during the Q&A portion. Um, but if you're interested in asking your question in person, um, you can also on your toolbar, there is um, a little icon that looks like a high five. You can raise your hand and either Rana or I will unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Um, if somebody types in a question that you are interested in, there is a little icon that you can hit that's a thumbs up. And what that does is if, if we get a lot of questions, it moves it up in the order. Um, so to be sure that the question gets asked. Um, and just a reminder that today is, is just an, in, an informational talk. It's not intended to replace the unique personal advice of your private physician. Um, and with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Flanagan. Dr. Flanagan is a board certified, he's board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, and advanced heart failure transplant. He has a special interest in the management of cardiogenic shock and critical care cardiology. He's also medical director of ANOVA's sports cardiology program. Before joining ANOVA, Dr. Flanagan served as the medical director for the heart failure clinics at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, and as the associate program director of the internal medicine residency at Walter Reed. Dr. Flanagan established ANOVA's sports cardiology program after serving nearly two decades in the U.S. Navy, helping to return service members to active duty following cardiac procedures. His goal is to better serve a wide range of athletes and physically active individuals of all skills and ages with or without cardiovascular disease with the goal of maximizing their performance. So with that, Dr. Flanagan, thank you for your time tonight and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Mona. Let me just share my screen here. And did that work? Everybody see my slides? All right. So uh, thank you for spending a little bit of your Tuesday evening with me. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, housekeeping items in addition to what Mona uh, just went through. Um, I want to take this opportunity to remind everybody that uh, healthcare screening is really important. Um, you have to pay attention to your symptoms and not to delay treatment, procedures, or surgeries. And uh, as was previously stated, one of the job titles I hold here at ANOVA is uh, a member of the Heart Failure and Transplant Service. If you remember approximately a year ago, in March, April, and May, when the pandemic first hit, uh, there was a, uh, a prevalence of people who were avoiding coming to their physician and uh, hospital for fear of contracting COVID uh, as part of a routine exam. The downstream effect, however, of that hesitancy to come to the hospital, whether you were just for screening or you're investigating symptoms, is we had a huge uptick in June, July, and August of people who were coming in critically ill from um, uh, delayed treatment of various cardiovascular diseases. And that resulted in uh, a, a rather large spike in the number of transplants we did as an institution. So I can't stress enough that if you have symptoms, particularly cardiovascular symptoms, to not delay. Moreover, now that we're a year out from the initiation of the pandemic, our mitigation strategies for uh, COVID are um, really world-class. Um, and if anybody wants to ask me about those specifically, I'm happy to answer those questions in addition to the sports cardiology related ones at the end of the talk. Um, please uh, feel free to call or make an appointment both with the sports cardiology department 
with your primary care doctor or specialist to talk about any of these symptoms. And as a helpful reminder, please, if you haven't get, got, got your COVID vaccine, please uh, get it. I just pulled off the Washington Post some statistics from the COVID vaccine recently. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, 48.8% of people are fully vaccinated and 67% of people have received at least one shot. In Maryland, 52% uh, have received full vaccination, 69% uh, one shot. And in DC, 59% are fully vaccinated and 68% of people have received at least one shot. Nationwide, uh, fully vaccinated people make up 44% of our national population and 53% have received the vaccine. So the DMV is still doing a little bit better than the national average, but still some room for improvement till we get to that ma magic 70 to 80% vaccination rate that will probably keep us safe the longest. Um, feel confident in your care. Uh, we practice uh, safe medicine here at ANOVA Fairfax and all of our ANOVA institutions. Um, and we have a, a wealth of information at the attached website there to articulate how we go about doing that. And um, if you are wondering about screenings of any kind, cardiovascular screenings, cancer screenings, routine health assessments, uh, please visit our website at anova.org backslash prevention. Uh, we have a robust vaccination site um, and you can uh, see what services we offer in that realm at anova.org backslash COVID-19 vaccine. And in order to find a physician, uh, there's a website there. Uh, with over 19,000 employees in the Innova Health System, I'm quite sure there's a physician to meet your needs, uh, wants, and desires. As Mona said, uh, my name is Casey Flanagan. I'm one of the heart failure and transplant cardiologists, but the bulk of my talk today will be as my, uh, one of my ancillary jobs as the medical director of sports cardiology, where we uh, partner with several local uh, professional sports teams, uh, several local collegiate teams, and a slew of high school uh, athletic teams to provide uh, consultative uh, and specialized care uh, for athletes. And because of that background, uh, we thought it was um, germane to talk about uh, exercise coming out of the COVID pandemic. So over the next 20 minutes, I want to talk about these um, six uh, topics. We're going to briefly just describe what exercise really means, um, and we're going to describe why you need exercise and the benefits those have in a number of different parameters. We'll then talk about all the recommendations from professional societies to include the American College of Cardiology on how you should exercise and how much you should exercise and what you should do for exercise. And fortunately, the dozen or so professional societies who have weighed into this uh, knee deep water have all kind of come to the same conclusion. So there's a uniformity to that that is I think beneficial for both us counseling physicians and patients. I thought we'd next talk about coronavirus, its impact on the heart and exercise because that's been a hot topic over the last year year. And um, uh, we can go through the evolution of thought based on that. Um, I know many of us uh, were rather sedentary during the last year uh, as a result of trying to stay safe and stay, stay away from people. And so I have a couple slides on suggestions on how to restart an exercise program if that's been a dormant part of your life for a while. And then finally, my last slide is uh, what we do specifically in Innova Sports Cardiology and how to reach us if you want uh, more information. So uh, I want to start by defining what physical activity and exercise are. So physical activity is really any bodily movement where you have to use your skeletal muscles. So if you're moving at all, we classify that as physical activity. Exercise, however, constitutes a subcategory of physical activity. And it's planned and it's structured and you're doing it for a reason, whether that's a main maintenance of physical or mental health, or that that's an improving of a skill or uh, a degree of fitness. Now, both are important. As a matter of fact, um, there have been several studies in the last decade linking sitting to increased rates, rates of death. I think the most famous one came out of Australia where they sampled almost 225,000 uh, patients over three years. And they broke those people into four categories. Those folks who sat less than four hours while they're awake, those who sat between four and eight hours while awake, those who sat between eight and 11 hours while they're awake, and those who sat more than 11 hours than while they're awake. And people who sat at the upper limits of uh, the, the continuum there, people in the eight to 11 or greater than 11 hour sitting, uh, had death, death rates of all causes, cancers, heart attack, strokes, that were 25 to 40% higher than those people who were sitting less than four hours. So clearly there's something with just being up and moving. 
But there's also something with exercise and that exercise uh, can have bountiful uh, effects on your body, um, whether you do aerobic exercise. So things like running, uh, jump rope, jogging, swimming, anything that gets the heart rate up, or whether you do resistance related exercise. So more like weightlifting or band work or plyometrics or those sorts of things. Both of uh, those forms of exercise and obviously combinations of both of them have profoundly beneficial effects on your body. When we talk about exercise, we really talk about the three components of exercise, and it's, it's somewhat self-explanatory. So when we, talk, when we recommend as physicians to patients to exercise, we make recommendations on the duration. How long should you exercise? The frequency, how many times a week, how many times a day should you exercise? And the intensity. And we can quantify intensity by two different scales. One, the calories you burn, or what are called kilocalories, uh, or metabolic equivalents. In the sports cardiology world, we tend to use the latter, metabolic equivalents. And what that means is uh, your body's energy expenditure relative to its resting metabolic rate. So let me explain that in non-scientific terms. Our bodies are constantly using and burning energy for our heart rate, for our breathing, for our, all of these cells and all of our organs to work, whether it's brain cells with thought, uh, gastric cells to digest food, or pancreas cells to make insulin and so on and so forth. So if you're sitting quietly in a chair, the amount of energy that your body uses is equivalent to one met. That's your, that's your baseline. So when we talk about activities that uh, achieve 2.5, 4, 10, or 15 mets of activity, essentially we're saying you're burning enough energy uh, relative to um, your resting rate of four, five, 10, 12 times that of just sitting and standing still. So what kind of activities get you met levels? So I, I thought I'd include this slide to give you an idea of some common activities and how many mets uh, they burn uh, uh, above baseline. So uh, if we look at our light activities here in the uh, far uh, left, Golfing with a cart, uh, one of the more common activities I see in our patient population, burns 2.5 mets of activity. And that uh, roughly equates to about 250, to, sorry, 215 calories in an hour. Something like golf, but walking almost doubles it to 4.4 mets of activity. Yard work, walking, mowing the lawn, 5.5 mets. Raking the lawn, four mets. Shoveling snow, six, six mets. And that equates to somewhere between 300 and 400 calories burned in an hour. More vigorous activity like running has a wide variety of metabolic activity. If you run at a 10 minute mile pace, you're burning about 10, you're using about 10 mets. So again, 10 times what the energy expenditure is for your body just sitting here. If you run a six minute mile, that's pretty impressive. You're using about 16 mets of activity. Uh, finally, swimming, uh, kind of recreational swimming, uh, six mets. Um, but if you're doing it at a moderate to fast pace uh, with a freestyle approach, you're, you're burning between eight and 10 mets of activity. Because the slide was kind of small, I put those same numbers uh, in a larger box here on the right. And you can see a wide variety of things uh, get you a wide range of metabolic activity. In sports cardiology, we like to classify individual sports based on more aerobic or more resistance in nature. So this graph or uh, figure has two axes to it. On the bottom, you see increasing dynamic component from low, something like bowling or golf to something more uh, moderate, uh, volleyball or baseball, and then something uh, high intensity like soccer or long distance running. On this axis, you're talking about more aerobic activity. Couple that with the um, a vertical axis here, and you can see things increasing in the amount of weight you have to lift to include flat out weightlifting, which is in this top category. If you go to the top right of this, you'll see the uh, activities that are both high in uh, an aerobic activity, but also high in resistance activity. Things like rowing, triathlon, and cycling, uh, forcing your body to exercise both its muscles uh, and its cardiovascular system. This comes into play if you should come into our clinic with an underlying cardiac condition that may limit some of your activity. We can go through various activities and figure out which ones are safe for your heart to do and which ones uh, confer a little bit higher of a risk. So the history of exercise, I think, is rather interesting. Um, the earliest publication 
uh, where exercise was shown to decrease bad health outcomes came from the 1950s. And a, uh, a professor at a local university in London, Professor Morris, uh, looked at the number of people who had heart attacks uh, on their double-decker buses. And they uh, compared the drivers of the double-decker bus with the conductors who are responsible for going up and down the stairs, back and forth to the front and the back of the bus to collect tickets uh, uh, as passengers arrived on the bus. So over the course of about five years, the conductors had about a 50% reduction in the amount of heart attacks compared to those of drivers. Now, when you do a scientific study, you'd like to control all the variables except for one so that you can say that that one variable was the difference. And this trial, uh, while interesting, didn't do that. So I can't just say that it was uh, walking up and down stairs and back and forth on a bus uh, reduces your heart attack risk by 50%. But what I can say it is rather compelling information that the more active you are, the lower risk rate of heart disease that you'll have. In the 1990s, we established the three components of exercise that I discussed three slides ago. Again, when you talk about exercise, it's important to talk about duration, frequency, and intensity. And over the next uh, two slides, we're going to talk about the positive effects of energy. So um, it's been shown to be equivalent to the use of antidepressants as first-line therapy for depression and anxiety. And the thought behind that is your uh, aerobic activity tends to release endorphins or uh, neurochemicals in your brain that lead to better moods. Often you'll hear runners talk about a runner's high uh, at a certain point in their run when they just start to feel better, both mentally and physically. And we think that comes from the release of things like dopamine and serotonin uh, as part of exercise, but also uh, the rather easy taking your mind off worries. If you're out for a jog, looking at the scenery <clears throat> or concentrating on your breathing as you exercise, you're less likely to think about your worries of the day. Uh, it's been shown exercise that uh, help people with confidence. It allows a vehicle for social interaction in today's world where you can exercise outside six feet apart. Uh, it's a really healthy and safe way uh, to socially interact with people. And it helps you deal with problems and cope with them in a really healthy way. It also has benefits biochemically on your body. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. So routine, moderate exercise, which we'll define at the end of the slide here, has led to the following things. So in your blood vessels, you have good cholesterol and you have bad cholesterol. Good cholesterol is HDL. It's represented in my schematic there as the little blue uh, circles. And what it does is it removes cholesterol plaque from the inside of your bodies. It's a mini rotor rooter for your body. Uh, also, you have LDL uh, cholesterol, bad cholesterol, which uh, attaches to the um, lining of your arteries, uh, builds plaque and starts to obstruct blood flow. So exercise will decrease your uh, LDL by four to six points and increase your HDL by 2.5 points. Now you might say, well, gee, those are really small numbers. If I had my cholesterol checked and my LDL, my bad cholesterol is 160, does it really make a difference if it goes from 160 to 140 or 154? Yeah, it does. Um, a reduction of that much will reduce your hit, uh, risk of heart attack and stroke by about three to 5%. Uh, an increase of HDL of 2.5 um, has a less significant impact on your overall heart health. But if you've got something good floating around in your body, even a small, about, a small amount of uh, more of it will probably be beneficial to you. Blood pressure has been shown to be uh, reduced uh, rather significantly with routine exercise. So a drop in systolic blood pressure of three to five points is average for people who exercise for continuously for more than uh, six to eight weeks. And a diastolic drop of two to four points can be seen over exercise uh, during that duration. So you might say, well, gee, if my blood pressure is 135 over 80, does it really matter after four to six to eight weeks of exercise that drops uh, to 132 over 76? Well, we know that every point you drop in systolic blood pressure, the top number of your blood pressure, results in about a 5% reduction of your lifetime risk of stroke. So if I told you, you could do something as simple as uh, exercising three times a week for six to eight weeks uh, for 30 minutes at a, at a clip, and I can dr you could drop your risk of stroke for the lifetime of 15%, I think that's something we'd all be interested in. What most of us use exercise for is uh, um, weight control. So we'll often see patients in clinic and they'll say, doc, how do I lose weight? And the losing weight's a relatively easy uh, equation. You have to eat less calories and burn more calories. Unfortunately, it's really hard to do or else all of us uh, wouldn't have uh, issues with weight. 
So in order to start losing weight, you actually have to double the recommended exercise prescription that I'm going to talk about. So um, uh, you'll see uh, in the uh, following slides that we'll walk um, that the uh, uh, various professional organizations recommend uh, about 150 minutes of exercise a week. Um, and if you're, uh, tell you what, it's just easier if I show you that slide next and then we get into what you need to do to lose weight. So the benefit of exercise is beyond just those individual controls. So beyond weight loss, beyond um, uh, blood pressure control, um, beyond cholesterol control, uh, exercise leads to uh, reductions in mortality. So uh, people live longer. If you calculated all the benefits to cholesterol and to blood pressure uh, and to diabetes and to weight, you would uh, find that exercise reduces uh, death by uh, only 60% of what it actually does. So there's an additional 40% benefit in reduction of your risk of death beyond just from risk factor control. Um, for every met of increase you do in your peak exercise. So let's say today you go out and exercise and you exercise for as hard as you can and you do a peak of eight mets of activity and you decide that you're going to improve that by uh, a dedicated exercise program over the next eight weeks. And eight weeks later we test you again and now you can do 10 mets of activity. Well each met increase uh, reduced your risk of death by 12%. So you drop your risk of death over the 20 years by about a quarter just by increasing your met level two. You have the most market reduction, and here's the, here's the I think, most important thing I'm going to say in this, all, this whole talk. The most important reduction in your cardiovascular risk, that's your risk for heart attack, that's your risk for stroke, is associated from going from a sedentary lifestyle where you exercise none to a low level of exercise. So this graph demonstrates this. So on the x-axis here, you have the number of hours you spend exercising. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, you have your mortality risk. So one represents 100%. So over the following couple of years, if you exercise even just an hour and a half a week, you have a 20% reduction. So from one to, uh, to 0.8 in your all-cause mortality, all your causes of death. If you exercise for the recommended two and a half hours per week, you drop that an additional 19% uh, all the way down to the mid 70% range. But you'll see that the biggest drop occurs in just going from no exercise to about an hour and a half of exercise a week. So the, the threshold for you to get up and get moving uh, and that resulting in a lower death rate is very, very low and it's achievable for nearly everybody. And then if you decide that you really want to get an exercise and you're exercising seven hours uh, a week, you'll see that the, the mortality risk continues to fall, but does so at a, at a uh, more gradual slope. Again, the biggest benefit is getting up and getting started. And then any additional benefit, while important, is less than that original benefit. So when we talk about exercise recommendations, the five most commonly cited recommendations are from the American College of Sports Cardiology, the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, the Department of Human uh, and Health Services, and the American College of Cardiology. So all of these uh, organizations have independently come out with guidelines, and all those guidelines, as I mentioned before, are, um, are, uh, are overlapping. So they recommend that all adults and adolescents and kids should engage in 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise on most days, but preferably all days. So what's moderate intensity activity? Uh, some examples of that are 150 minutes, so 30 minutes a day, five days a week of walking at a 3.3 mile per hour pace. So if you do that five times a week, um, that is the minimum to do to see a benefit in mortality, to improve your longevity that first kind of drop that we saw on the preceding graph. If you remember three slides ago when I was attempting to talk about weight loss, you have to double this in order to get uh, a significant uh, amount of weight loss. So you can either double it by increasing your duration from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. You could uh, in increase your speed from three miles an hour walk to a six uh, mile an hour light jog, you can do it more frequently by going multiple times uh, a day. Um, it doesn't really matter which variable you change, the intensity, duration, or frequency, but you have to double uh, total. Uh, 
Uh, another way to get uh, to the exercise threshold is by less time, but more intensity. So they are, instead of walking for 150 minutes a week, you jog for 75 minutes a week. If you're able to do this, there's, as I said before, approximately a 31% reduction in your likelihood of death uh, over the next 20 years. So that's why exercise is important. That's how you exercise, and that's how often you should exercise. Let's talk a little bit about coronavirus and uh, the heart. So uh, back in the early part of 2019, and I'm um, sorry, the late part of 2019 and the early part of 2020, we were very concerned not only about the pandemic, but the virus's effects on your heart. And they came from about four studies out of Wuhan, of which I've, I've uh, included one here for your reference. So most of these studies came out of a single hospital. And there were four different hospitals, but the data came from one particular hospital. And this particular one, it came from Remnant Hospital in Wuhan. And over the course of a month, from January to February of 2020, they had 416 patients who were hospitalized with coronavirus um, uh, infections. Nearly 20% of them, so 82 of the 416, had evidence of heart damage, what we call myocardial injury, at some point in time during their hospitalization. Those patients tended to be older. They tended to have more comorbidities. So those are other health problems like high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, obesity. They had higher white counts, more inflammation, and had higher levels of uh, things we check for for heart attacks. So troponin, myoglobin, CKMB uh, are, are proteins that are in your heart muscle that end up in the bloodstream only when there's been damage or strain to your heart. And people who had injury to their heart muscle, or at least medical or uh, lab injury to your heart muscle, had more complications. They were more likely to have um, what's called um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, uh, injuries to their kidneys or blood clotting. And most importantly, people who had positive evidence of heart damage as part of their coronavirus infection died at 51% rate, where those who didn't died at around a four and a half percent rate. So that's uh, a rather significant increase. So here's a table that shows just the same thing. This uh, column represents all people who were admitted to the hospital with coronavirus over this one month period. This uh, middle column indicates people who uh, were admitted and had uh, evidence of heart damage. And this uh, column represents the people who were admitted uh, without heart damage. You can see here that people with heart damage had higher needs of oxygen requirements, uh, mask requirements for oxygen, or actually requiring intubation and ventilation, breathing tube insertion. Uh, they had higher rates of, as I said, lung damage, kidney damage, um, liver damage, and blood clot. And as you can see here, uh, people who had evidence of heart damage had higher rates of death and inability to be discharged from the hospital. This is a graphic form of the things I just presented on the table. So the graph on the left represents time from symptom onset, and the graph on the right rem uh, uh, represents time from admission. And you'll see people who had evidence of heart damage immediately had a lower survival than those people with the same infection who uh, didn't have heart damage. And whether you uh, quantify that by when they got symptoms or when they got to the hospital, outcomes were just as bad. So we got to worry. Does this virus affect the heart muscle? We know that lots of viruses cause an entity called myocarditis. Myo being muscle, cardo meaning heart, itis meaning inflammation. So viruses we know cause inflammation of heart muscle. Now there's essentially two ways to do that. Either the virus can directly invade the heart cells and cause damage, or the immune system, the antibodies our body make to fight off that virus have collateral damage and cross-react with heart cells damaging them that way. This can lead to heart attacks, it can lead to heart failure, and it can lead to abnormal heart rhythms or arrhythmias. Um, we became a little bit more concerned in the mid part of uh, 2020 by a study out of Germany. In this study, they took 100 patients who were uh, uh, um, tested positive for coronavirus between April and June of 2020. Some of them were admitted to the hospital, some of them were not. Um, about two and a half months after they are completed their recovery from coronavirus, everybody got an MRI of the heart. And the reason they got an MRI of the heart is because that's the test we look for when we're investigating whether there's inflammation or myocarditis uh, of the heart. 
Uh, you can see here that of the 100 patients, 67 of them were completely uh, cared for in their home, and a third of them were hospitalized. On the day when they came in, approximately 71 days after their quarantine ended or after they were discharged from the hospital, you can see here that about a third of them had symptoms of some kind, whether that was residual shortness of breath or exhaustion, palpitations, or chest pain. What they found, and this is a fairly significant, um, this is a fairly um, uh, uh, scientific slide, so I'm going to kind of just uh, skim off the top of it, is people who had um, uh, coronavirus uh, compared to other people who didn't have coronavirus at all um, had lower ejection fractions. So their heart squeezed less strongly than those people affected with coronavirus, uh, both on the left side and the right side. They also had more evidence of inflammation and more evidence of scar, meaning old um, damage to the heart muscle. So um, there were higher rates of active inflammation even three months after uh, their infection. And a significant number of people, whether they were admitted to the hospital or out of the hospital uh, when they had coronavirus, uh, had residual scar or inflammation, um, indicating again that the heart muscle uh, was damaged as part of their illness. You can see here on this plot graph that the healthy controls uh, had uh, a little evidence of blood work in um, concerning for heart muscle damage. Um, if you recovered at home, you had elevated uh, blood markers. And if you're in the hospital, those elevations were slightly even higher. So radiographically by MRI and by blood testing, we, we found that people infected with coronavirus had heart muscle damage. Now, the worry with that is that when you go to exercise with inflammation of your heart, or you go to exercise with scar of your heart, you're at higher risk for abnormal heart rhythms that are potentially lethal to you. So um, unfortunately, we lose athletes uh, on the playing field uh, annually. Fortunately, not many, but the number one cause of people dying unexpectedly on the playing field is myocarditis. And that's not necessarily due to COVID. As I said before, all viruses can do it. Uh, but we were concerned that so many people all at once got coronavirus and that uh, in a high percentage of those people had heart muscle damage, whether they stayed at home or whether they got admitted to the hospital, we were going to see a rash of athletes, particularly professional athletes, when they're exerting themselves, eliciting these abnormal heart rhythms. So we got together um, and uh, came up with a protocol with Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, the National Hockey League, the National Football League, and the National Basketball Association and Women's Basketball Association, that every player, before they returned to uh, competition in 2020, had to get tested for coronavirus, both an active infection, which is the nasal swab PCR test, or by previous infection, which is a blood test looking for whether excuse me, or not, you had antibodies. And anybody who tested positive, either by the nasal swab or by the blood test, had to undergo cardiac testing before going back to the field of play. Over the course of <clears throat> about six to eight months, we, we as a profession screened nearly 800 professional athletes. Their mean age was 25, not 35. That's a typo on my part. And unfortunately, 98% of them were men because we were looking at the professional sports with only the Women's Basketball Association providing female examples to the study. About 60% of people when they had infection had respiratory symptoms and the other 42% either had no symptoms at all or had really mild symptoms just like loss of smell or a brief headache. Only one of the nearly 800 athletes required a hospitalization and the testing that I'm going to describe was done 19 days after the diagnosis on average. So you can see here through all the professional leagues, everybody got three tests. They got a blood test, again, that troponin, that protein that's in your heart muscle that ends up in the bloodstream only when there's been damage or strain to your heart. They got a blood test, they got an EKG, and they got an ultrasound of their heart, what we call an echocardiogram. And you can see here that of the nearly 800 um, um, athletes, there were six people who had a positive blood test, 10 people who had an abnormal electrocardiogram, and 20 people, or 2.5%, who had an abnormal echocardiogram. So of those 800 people, only 3.8% had a positive screen in one way. They, all the people who had a positive screen, so these 30 people right here, some people had multiple things wrong with them. Every one of those got the MRI that I described in the German study to look for active inflammation or active scar. And of those 30, of the five patients, five athletes had some abnormality on their MRI that required us to say, you know what, let's hold you out of play. 
in hindsight, we were being extra cautious during this time period. And those five affiliates probably could have played, but let's say they couldn't. So um, um, five out of 800 athletes had uh, heart damage that made us concerned uh, for overall infection. Now in 2021, we believe that if we did the same study on a bunch of people who got influenza one year or got the common cold one year, we would find very similar results. Coronavirus is clearly more damaging to your body than the flu or uh, a regular virus. Please don't mince my words. However, its effect on the heart is not nearly as dramatic as we uh, had concerned, uh, what we had concerned for at the early part of 2020. And in fact, most patients who have had infection can go back to play without further testing. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So there's also a logistic component to this. If we took the millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people worldwide who have been infected with coronavirus and we tried to screen all of their hearts prior to them returning to levels of exercise, um, there's not enough money, time, or resources in the world to do that. So we kind of focus on a couple of variables. One, what's the age of the athlete? We're more likely to screen an older athlete than a younger athlete. Number two, and this is probably the most important, what's the severity of disease? We know right now that if you tested positive for coronavirus and never had symptoms or just lost your sense of taste or smell or had a mild headache, we know that your risk of having heart-related damage from that infection is very low. However, if you were sick enough to be in the hospital or sick enough to be the intensive care unit, we know that that rate of heart damage is significantly higher. And those people, once they're discharged from the hospital and once they've completed quarantine, probably should see a cardiologist before they start exercising. Um, and then lastly, the level of anticipated exercise. If you're going to try to do an Ironman triathlon, I'm going to have a little uh, more uh, concern about how your heart's going to function at peak exercise if you're uh, compared to somebody who's uh, desires to get out and walk uh, around the neighborhood for 30 minutes a day, uh, six days a week. So there are very complicated uh, algorithms on how to screen patients before going back to sports. Here's one for high school athletes. Here's one for master athletes, which is defined as those over the age of 35. And here's one uh, for uh, professional or collegiate athletes. The short of all of these is if you have symptoms that required hospitalization, you should see a doctor uh, prior to exercising again. If you did not have symptoms, uh, or had minor symptoms that just required you to stay home, you do not need to see a doctor before going back to exercise. So I got this from my uh, time in, in the Department of Defense, and here's how you gradually return to physical activity. They broke it down into five stages with a subcategory uh, in stage uh, three. Um, and what they look for here is a gradual increase in your activity level, both in the intensity and in the duration. And they gave you some examples here. So stage one is just you uh, living at home, walking around, doing nothing more strenu strenuous than that. Stage two uh, talks about light jogging uh, at an average pace of 15 minutes a mile for no more than a quarter, of, uh, I'm sorry, three quarters of a mile at a time, or riding a stationary bike at low resistance. Our goal is to get your heart rate max, and you calculate your heart rate max by 220 minus your age, less than 70% of whatever that number is. And then over the course of several days to several weeks, depending on uh, how you feel, you gradually increase the amount of activity and the duration of the activity and the intensity of the activity until you're in stage five and you're back to your normal level of exertion. While this was developed for people with uh, COVID-19, it can be applied to anybody particularly people who have been sedentary for the last year out of requirements due to the pandemic. Um, this is the other slide in that Department of Defense uh, mailer that shows that the um, uh, each day you spend at that stage increases with the severity of disease. So if you were asymptomatic, at a minimum, you could spend one day at each stage before you got back to full exercise. Whereas if you had high severity, they recommended staying at about five to seven days at each stage before advancing to the next stage. My last slide, as I promised, was uh, what did we do in Inova Sports Cardiology? So as Mona said at the beginning, we have a couple of different um, patient populations that we see frequently. One is the competitive athlete who has either cardiovascular uh, symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, or an underlying heart disease. Um, they have a valve problem. They have underlying cardiomyopathy, something like that. We'll see those patients and try to quantify how um, 
uh, much impact does their heart condition have on their exercise and come up with an exercise prescription for them. Second is the recreational athlete, people like me, people who, you know, maybe play a little pickup basketball or, or go for a jog or lift weights or take an aerobics class or something along those lines. If they have symptoms or they want to increase their activity level uh, and they want to know how to do it, we'll see those patients. Um, and then the third patient is the patient who wants to start an exercise program, whether it was sedentary or you're getting over an illness or you recently had an orthopedic surgery that required you to not be able to exercise for an extended period of time, we can come up with an exercise plan and exercise prescription on how to do that. We are a multidisciplinary team. We look, uh, we have uh, cardiovascular genomics, advanced imaging like MRIs and CAT scans. We have structural heart disease to deal with our uh, valvular problems. Uh, we have an exercise physiologist. Sometimes we'll do uh, cardiopulmonary exercise stress testing where we actually run you on a treadmill while monitoring your heart and lungs and seeing how they function under high stress. And we have electrophysiologists that help us deal with arrhythmias. Each individual patient is different. Each individual medical problem is different and each individual goal for exercise is different. So we take a very individualized patient centric approach, but what is the common thread is we wanna ensure that people can get back to play safely. So the easiest thing for a doctor to do is to tell you, listen, there's something wrong with your heart. We recommend you don't exercise. That way you don't get in trouble and we don't get in trouble. But exercise provides such a profound mental and physical health benefit that we understand the importance. So we are far more aggressive at returning people to exercise as long as we can do it safely. Um, and as I said before, we help patients develop an exercise plan with an emphasis on sustainability and safety. Here's our website, uh, and I understand everybody will get a copy of this lecture, so you can uh, click on that link. Um, but also, if you just Google Anova Sports Cardiology, uh, the link comes up. I want to thank you for your time. I have, we've got about 25 minutes for questions, and uh, Mona, I'll turn it back over to you. Mona, you're muted. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, if anyone has questions they would like to post, if you can add those to the Q&A section um, and we'll get to those. I do have a couple that were submitted in advance that we can go to. Um, there was a question about uh, having high blood pressure and whether they need to be careful about exercising. Sure. Um, so... I learned, I've been doing this for 17 years um, and I learned to never speak in absolutes. So uh, um, the answer is generally no. So as I said in my uh, presentation, uh, exercise has been shown to reduce your blood pressure by three to five points in the top number systolic and about two to four points in the diastolic number. We also know that exercising increases your blood pressure. So we've checked blood pressures on Olympic power lifters and those guys, while they're lifting, get blood pressures in the 250 to 300 range. And we know from people on treadmills, when we check your blood pressure during a stress test or a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test, that we'll tolerate blood pressures up into the low 200s as part of exercise as long as they come down. So the presence of high blood pressure or hypertension should not preclude you from exercise. However, if your blood pressure resting is in the 170s or 180s, I would recommend seeing a, a physician, either your primary care doctor or cardiologist, and coming up with a blood pressure control plan to get it down to the 140s and 150s at the very least before exercising. Keeping in mind, our goal for everybody for blood pressure is less than 130 over 80. Okay. All right, I see Joseph has raised his hand electronically, so I'm going to unmute you and you should be able to ask your question directly. Oop. Hi, um, I'm in my 80s. I have a, I use a, a pacemaker, but I'm finding myself um, short of breath with fairly minimal activity. Although I try to bicycle 20, to 30 miles a day, uh, several times a week. I mean, do I need to worry about the shortness of breath? Wow. Uh, Joseph, um, thank you for your question. Thank you for joining. And congratulations on such a rigorous exercise protocol um, uh, throughout your life. Um, the answer to your question is maybe. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, Joseph, um, may I ask, um, you, I assume you've been an exerciser for um, uh, many years, if not decades. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think you could probably tell me uh, that you, uh, at the age of, uh, in your 80s, uh, aren't exercising like you were able to in your 40s. 
So comparing uh, those two uh, benchmarks is apples and oranges. So my question to you would be, have you found a significant decrease in your exercise capacity, how much you can exercise, how long you can exercise, how hard you can exercise before getting that shortness of breath you described? Is there a significant difference over the last six months to 12 months? Uh, well, over the last 12 to 24 months. Yeah. So um, what I would say is it's always better to get checked out than not. My suspicion is it is nothing uh, malignant or concerning. Um, however, it always could be. So the first thing I would do if I saw you in clinic or if your primary care doctor saw you in clinic was do some basic testing of your heart's overall function. If you have a pacemaker and you see one of our folks here in our, in our group um, at ANOVA, uh, an echocardiogram, an ultrasound, and an interrogation of your pacemaker would probably be where I started. Um, and then uh, if those check out, I think I'd let you exercise um, continually until you came up uh, with a, a firm um, diary of exercise. And by that, I mean, if you tell me I can do 20, but when, when I try to do 22 minutes of exercise, I always run into problems there. That helps us kind of quantify where to go from next. So I, I answered you in some sort of, uh, uh um, uh, vagarities a little bit, um, but uh, it's tough to see without, it's tough to give you firm advice without uh, looking you in the eye, so to speak. Great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. All right. Um, all right. There's a there's two questions um, that I want to raise. Let's see. There was um, what types of cardiac conditions would be problematic for yeah. exercise? So essentially what I'll say is if you're going to exercise and you have chest pain or shortness of breath with exercise that goes away with rest, that could be indicative of an underlying cardiac condition. Now, um, the ones I worry about the most as a sports cardiologist are um, problems with your valve, uh, and the most common one being aortic stenosis, a narrowing of the aortic valve, um, and uh, coronary artery disease, or the development of plaque in the arteries around your heart. You'll remember, maybe, from one of my slides, a diagram of cholesterol, and that LDL, that bad uh, cholesterol forming plaque and obstructing blood flow. We worry about those uh, two things. Does that mean you can't exercise if you have either of those? Absolutely not. We actually encourage exercise even in those uh, underlying disease processes. However, um, uh, we would come up with an exercise prescription where we feel like we could, you could exercise safely uh, and get the benefits of exercise without exposing yourself to risk. Okay. All right. And kind of as a follow on to that is, um, does your sports cardiology program work in coordination with a cardiac rehab program? The answer to that is, yeah, yes and no. So what, uh, for those of the, uh, of you who don't know, cardiac rehab is nothing more than supervised exercise. It's great. So um, it's usually 36 sessions divided over 12 weeks. So that's three times a week for 12 weeks. And it's been shown to um, improve mortality, so make you live longer, and improve morbidity, improve your symptoms and keep you out of the hospital in several groups of patients, those being anybody who's undergone cardiac surgery, bypass, valve surgery, open heart surgery of any kind, uh, people who have, under, who have had heart attacks or, or gotten stents in their arteries, or people with heart failure. So in those three groups of people, um, uh, the recommendation is for us to send folks to cardiac um, rehab to exercise. And the benefit there is uh, twofold. Number one, whenever you have a cardiac condition, uh, I think it's human nature to start worrying about your heart and human nature to say, you know what, I'm just going to take it easy and not stress my heart. And while that intuitively makes sense, it pragmatically and practically doesn't because the more active you are, no matter how old or what your underlying heart condition is, generally the better off you're going to do. So it gives people the confidence after 12 weeks of exercise that they are safe to exercise. And the second thing it does is it gets in the people in the habit of exercise. If you have to go to cardiac rehab, and we have, I think, cardiac rehab here at Inova Fairfax. I think we have it at um, Mount Verdon and Loudoun. Um, so a couple sites in the system. Mona, do you know specifically where? And Alexandria. Oh, and Alexandria. Good. Um, that um, it gets you in, in the habit of going someplace to exercise, which after the 12 weeks is, is concluded, hopefully you can use that to continue, whether that's going to a track, going to a gym or those sorts of things. Okay. All right. And let's see. Um, 
someone who would like to run and take off some weight, but they get out of breath quickly, what would you recommend? Yeah. So the first rule of exercise is finding something you like doing. I hate running. <laughs> so um, running's uh, particularly challenging to me. Uh, I'd prefer to be doing something as I'm exercising, whether that's uh, playing a sport um, uh, or um, uh um, well, uh, interacting with uh, like a ball or another person or something along the lines of uh, something to keep my mind off the fact I'm exercising, so to speak. So um, the problem with exercising is that it takes about six to eight weeks before your body starts making uh, changes in uh, how it handles the exercise. So if you diligently exercise 60 minutes a day, four to five days a week, which is what I told you you're going to have to do to start losing weight, um, you're not going to see any benefits on your stomach or your hips or wherever else you're hiding weight for six to eight weeks. Human nature is we tend to get discouraged around week five. So right before you start to see benefit to the exercise where, um, is when we go, you know what, this isn't working for me. I'm not going to do it. So the way to do it is to slowly increase your frequency and your duration every week. So for instance, if you like working out on the treadmill and you're starting off with a light jog, so let's say you're doing it at like four miles an hour and you want to do it for 25 minutes at a time because that's as far as you can go before getting short of breath, that's great. You're going to do that five days a week for a week. Then the following week, you're going to either increase the duration by a minute or you're going to increase the intensity by 0.1. And over the course of several weeks, your body will slowly adapt and slowly condition itself to the higher rates or higher durations of exercise. And before you know it, you'll be able to do the 60 minutes of running at six miles an hour uh, without the shortness of breath. Unfortunately, there's not a quick fix to this. You just have to trust me that every time you're doing it, your body's getting a little bit better, whether you can feel it or not. And really small increases in exercise mentally allows you to go, you know what? I set a goal and I met it. Good for me. Now I'm on to the next goal and to the next goal. So you keep setting uh, incrementally higher goals, but very achievable goals. And I think it helps with your psyche as well. Okay. All right. And here's another question that was just posted. Um, and it's a question about, do you recommend exercise tracking watches similar to what Apple offers? Yeah. Uh, the answer is if you want to. So there's a lot of data out there about using uh, what we call wearable exercise technology, Fitbits, Apple Watches, and those sorts of things. A lot of people are very goal-oriented. And so if you say, you know, this watch reminds me to exercise, it reminds me to get up and move when I'm at the office or at home, and it keeps track of how many steps I do or my target heart rate or the amount of time I spend above 85% of my target heart rate, which is where you have to be to improve cardiovascular fitness. If that's something that helps you exercise, then absolutely. If that's something that you don't find helpful to your exercise regimen, I don't think there's any additional benefit to obtaining some of that wearable technology. So it all depends on your psyche. I will say that most humans find that helpful and therefore those Fitbits and those Apple watches, I think are a nice addition to somebody's exercise regimen. As in a quick aside, you know, everybody talks about getting to 10,000 steps and that um, I think uh, I don't have a Fitbit or an Apple watch, but I think they alarm or they uh, buzz when you reach that 10,000 step mark. It's funny because that originated from a pedometer that was developed in Japan in the 70s. And the marketing uh, arm of the company that made the pedometer uh, arbitrarily picked a goal of 10,000 steps. And somehow that's just been propagated. So more activity is always better for your heart, without question. I'm not sure 10,000 steps is enough. It might be too much. The number might be 8,000 steps. I don't know. So using the wearable technology as a goal is important, but making sure you set that goal as something that we know improves your overall outcomes, I think is also important. Okay. All right. And here's one, and it is a point that you've already covered, but I think it's worth circling back to. It was somebody who used to go to the gym frequently before the pandemic and asking whether they should go to their doctor for a physical before they go back to the gym. Yeah. Um, my answer is maybe again. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> it depends on your underlying health conditions. If you have no uh, known heart disease uh, to start with, um, and your concern is uh, getting back into your normal exercise routine, I'm not sure you need to come to the doctor for that. That being said, the American College of Cardiology 
uh, does have a recommendation for stress testing in people who want to start an exercise program. So if it's something that will improve your psyche and give you more confidence to exercise, then absolutely please come see a cardiologist. We'll get you checked out. If you have an underlying heart condition and you haven't exercised in the last year because of the pandemic, I would recommend you coming to the physician, your internist, your family practitioner, your cardiologist to get a quick checkup before uh, initiating an exercise plan. Okay. And here's a question of, will exercise improve the heart muscles heal or uh, to heal or grow after a heart attack? Yeah. In, including with stents. Yeah. So um, what a heart attack is, uh, is heart muscle dying. And like brain tissue, unfortunately, when um, heart muscle dies, I can't get it back. That's dead. But what you can do is exercise, excuse me, helps prevent future attacks. And once you have a heart attack or have a stent put in, we know your risk of having a subsequent heart attack or subsequently requiring a stent is exponentially higher than that if you had never had the original event. So exercise will help prevent secondary events. But moreover, excuse me, moreover to your question, what you're doing with exercise is you're training the other muscle cells around the damaged cells to work more efficiently. You're training your blood pressure, your blood vessels to efficiently move blood to skeletal muscles. And so your body can function at levels of heart function that are a little lower. So the example I always like to give is that of Lance Armstrong. And it's not the best example because I think there also might have been some performance enhancing drugs that uh, uh, weighed into this and we don't recommend those. However, when you look at heart function, we judge how well the heart squeezes by something called the ejection fraction. And a normal number is about 60%, which means with each squeeze of the heart, your heart pumps out 60% of the blood contents for your body to use. When you're an athlete, and when you train yourself, you are making the heart squeeze more efficiently and you're making your skeletal muscles, so your, your quadriceps, your calf muscles if you're a runner, your biceps and your um, uh, triceps if you're lifting weights or doing push-ups. You're making those muscles work more efficient, efficiently on less blood flow. So they, when they tested Lance Armstrong before he won the Tour de France, his ejection fraction was actually 35%. So almost half of what a normal person is. And the reason for that is he had trained his body so much that his heart, his body was working so efficiently when he was at rest, his heart really didn't need to beat that hard because his body was so good at doing everything else for the heart. Then when he would exercise, when he would get on the bike, he would climb a hill, his ejection fraction would peak back up to 60, 65, 70 percent like it should. So getting back to that uh, viewer's question, what you're doing is you're improving the function of heart muscle around the dead tissue, but you're also improving the body's ability to function at lower heart levels to help compensate for the damage you, you had unfortunately suffered. Okay. All right. And so Francis has a hand up and I have just unmuted you, I believe. Francis still appears muted. Oh, let me try again. Okay. Oh, there she is. Yes, Francis. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had tried to get in touch with the phone number on your um, website, and the lady I talked to said she had no idea what I was talking about <laughs> and she didn't know what, how I could get in touch with you or how I could find out about this program. I think it would be perfect for me, and I really would like to join. How can I do it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, Francis, I see your name uh, here. Are you a patient here at Inova? Um, I'm with Virginia Hart. Oh, wonderful. Who do you see at Virginia Hart? Dr. Truesdale. Okay, so um, Dr. Truesdale was in the Army, and I was in the Navy, but we <laughs> st we're still on a talking basis. So how about I do this for you, Francis? Uh, I'm going to fix uh, the phone uh, uh, number issue, um, but if it's okay with you, uh, I'm going to get in contact with you through Dr. Truesdale and the Virginia Heart Group uh, so we can get you in uh, to the clinic. Does that sound good? That, was, that would be great. I see him next Monday, so that's good. Okay, great. I'll, uh, I'll give him a call before then. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Francis, if you can re-mute. Oh, actually, I think I got it. Okay, all right, and I know we're coming up to time. Um, there is one more question that was posted that we haven't gotten to yet. And it was it is someone who um, 
has a number of, of conditions, um, has a stent, they're diabetic, has asthma, did cardiac rehab at Loudon, was on track exercising until COVID hit. I think that applies to a lot of people. Um, they started walking every day and now they go back to the gym using their asthma meds, but find that they're huffing and puffing a lot after five to 10 minutes on elliptical. And they're wondering if that would be their, would be asthma or their heart or what your thoughts might be. Yeah, there's probably a couple of issues at play with all those three things. So a portion of it is probably deconditioning because of the layoff in time. And um, uh, part of it is most likely your asthma and part of it could be your heart. So the test for you in this particular scenario is to undergo what's called a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test. So in this particular test, we put you on a treadmill. We hook you up to EKG leads and have you walk on the treadmill. And we have a, a mask that looks a little like the fighter pilot masks uh, that they wear in the movies. And what that measures is the amount of oxygen that you take in and the amount of carbon dioxide you put out. And based over the course of however long you're able to walk on the treadmill, um, we can determine, are you limited because of lung function? in which case we need to do a better job of controlling your asthma, or are you limited due to a heart function, or are you limited due to neither, and it's just the fact that you've been uh, unfortunately unable to exercise for a, a, an extended period of time and are deconditioned. So whoever asked that question, um, you could see your cardiologist to set that up, or you could see us in the Innova Sports Cardiology Group, and we can uh, get you squared away. Uh, and since uh, Francis had uh, brought up that question about the comment about uh, people being unable to phone, uh, why don't you just give me till next week before anybody calls that number and I'll have the, uh, the issue fixed. So anybody calling that number uh, will actually get somebody who knows what, uh, where to find me. Yes. And um, we'll be sure in the follow-up email and the copy of the recording of tonight that we'll, we'll put the correct phone number in the follow-up email for everyone to get. So, okay. So we are at time. Um, so I just want to thank Dr. Flanagan. I think that was a wonderful presentation. Very interesting. I feel like I should um, go do some push-ups after we finish this <laughs> evening. Um, and I also want to thank all the attendees um, for, for joining us. And if you have additional questions, you can feel free to um, email Rana or myself. We'll get those over to Dr. Flanagan. And uh, when you leave the webinar today, there is a short survey that we really would appreciate you taking. It helps us identify other topics that would be of interest for these Ask the Experts. Um, and it gives us uh, the feedback to give to Dr. Flanagan on how he did this evening. Um, and it's only nine questions, so it's really pretty quick. You also have the ability there that if you want someone from Dr. Flanagan's office to follow up with you, um, you can put in your contact information. So, um, so on behalf of Inova, I just want to thank everyone for joining us and Dr. Flanagan for your time. And the re we're just going to all go exercise now because we've been duly inspired. How about? So. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for spending your Tuesday with me. Have a great after, uh, rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's a valuable program. It's just being recorded. All right.